On a whim, one cold evening, you decided to take a walk. You strolled aimlessly under an ominous cloudy sky, tinted orange with light from the town below. Somehow, you wended your way into an unfamiliar, derelict place pervaded by an eerie silence and stillness. Abandoned factories, spiked fences, and the air of urban decline greeted your eyes wherever you looked. One sight in particular drew you in, a rusty, twisted gateway sitting amidst the industrial wasteland. Pushed on by some unseen force, you stepped through, the air shimmering slightly as you did so. As soon as you exited the other side, you were certain you were no longer in your own world, though you couldn't point to anything around you that had changed. The gateway still stood behind you, but the slight shimmer in the air around it had vanished. You continued walking in an almost dreamlike state, your surroundings suddenly looming menacingly around you. Everything feels sinister, from the buildings to the trees around you. Crows are perched all around, their gaze following your every move. You continue on, becoming increasingly worried until a new set of sounds met your ears. The gentle lapping of waves, the creak of rigging, and the flutter of sails in a rising breeze. As you take in the sights of shadowy vessels and murky waters, a voice addresses you from the gloom. Hello there, pal. Welcome to the Docklands. You turn to see an elderly man in a long coat step from the darkness towards you. His hair is grain, his facial features somehow angular, and an accent a thick Scottish. His hand is extended towards you in a friendly manner, and he somehow seems to exude an air of reassurance and familiarity despite the nature of your current surroundings. You accept the pre-offered handshake, and he speaks again. Looks a wee bit creepy around here, doesn't it? Well, you're not wrong, pal. Still, this place isn't so bad when you get to do it a little better. Besides, you wouldn't have been drawn here if it didn't have at least a little something to offer you, would you now? He smiles. How about I give you the tour? I'm the Harb. Well... Around here I'm just a cone roust about, to be honest. Still, I know the place pretty well, and hopefully you will too by the time I've shown you around. No need to panic, if you don't like it here I can send you home no trouble, but I have a feeling you might want to stay. So, what do you say? Would you like to take a look around? Take a look around? No. The roust about nods gently, his face exuding an air of understanding. Suit yourself, he says. Maybe we'll meet again someday. Till then, goodbye. He produces an amulet from the depths of his coat, and you snap awake in your own bed, a hand-rolled cigarette beside you. End here. Yes. The Raspau smiles enthusiastically. I thought you might want to, he says conversationally. You would best stick close to me, at least until I get you settled. This place can be a little... intimidating. At least until you can get used to it. Don't forget that if you change your mind later, I can still send you home. Continue. The roustabout nods at your decision. As you wish, on with the door. I'll show you the truth of the place, what and all. You want a place to lay your head, a means of making a living, and run down of the more challenging aspects of living here. Before all that, though, there are a few things you should be aware of. Things to be aware of. Eternal Night. It is always night at the Docklands, though oddly enough the moon still seems to rise, set, and go through its phases. The vegetation of the Docklands seems completely oblivious to the lack of sun, and continues to grow slowly in a kind of seasonless limbo. Other issues such as vitamin D deficiency also do not seem to arise. Endless Expanse Landward, the industrial wasteland that surrounds the Docklands seems to continue forever, with no means of traversal beyond foot you'll have little chance on such a voyage. Seaward seems much the same, though the constant stream of ships into the Docklands indicates some connection to places beyond. Miscommunication Most every resident of the Docklands, apart from the roustabout, seem to have some level of difficulty communicating with their neighbours. Many do not speak any language you are familiar with, some do not speak at all, and even those who you can converse with are often distant for other, less tangible reasons. Transients. The Docklands are a place of comings and goings. New residents arrive and depart periodically on the steady stream of craft servicing the port. 
Many of these are hard to get to know, staying only a little while I'm feeling very much like anonymous members of a crowd. Those that stay longer make good potential friends and usually have led interesting lives. Crows. Ever since you arrived here, they have been watching you, their eyes filled with diabolical intent. The various species of crow that inhabit the Docklands are understood by all as a friend not to be trifled with. Crows will eat anything, including you, if they get the opportunity. Learn their habits, and never be so foolish as to underestimate them. Departure. The Raspout promises that if you're not interested in staying by the time your tour is done, then he'll take you home. If you do choose to stay, that offer remains open, if you can find him. He says he travels a lot with work, so he may be hard to pin down. The portal you entered by, it seems, is a one-way ticket, but there may be other ways out. That stuff will affect you no matter what. Not to say that it's all bad, it's just us. Now then, shall we continue? You turn to the waterfront, where several vessels are bobbing on the inky black water. A few small buildings line the area, and further out, you can see the mouth of the Docklands leading out to a pitch black ocean, lit faintly by a half-obscured moon. As you are taking the scene in fully, the Rastabout speaks to you again. The next thing you want to sort out here is a place to hang your hat. There's quite a few vacant places you can set up in. It isn't too crowded around here. Depending on whether you're more of a seafarer or a landlubber, you may find how it affects your stay in the Docklands, but each place has its own charms. Accommodation. Choose one, plus one perk. Yacht. Looking like something from an age gone by, the yacht is a decent sized single mast wooden sailing vessel that's rugged and dependable despite its apparent age. Fairly easy to operate even without a working knowledge of sailing, there always seems to be at least a soft breeze blowing across the Docklands, so you'll never find yourself becalmed. Below decks you'll find a basic cabin, pod sized bathroom with shower, and a small kitchenette with a gas stove. Though these conditions are somewhat spartan, there's plenty of room up on deck to relax, stretch your legs, or entertain guests. On the water, the yacht glides along calmly and smoothly, almost silent, save for the creak of rigging. Seafarer. Take two water hazards and four land hazards. Take four water features and two land features. Perks. First mate. Your ship functions as your second in command and will happily sail itself, raising canvases and adjusting the tilter to follow any instructions you issue. If you direct it to sail to a location, it will do so to the best of its ability. Your vessel is a good soldier and always follows orders, however inadvisable, so think carefully before you give them. Captain's Cabin Stepping into your cabin you realise immediately that it somehow extends beyond the boundaries of normal space. Though the portholes show the views you will expect outside the room size is more befitting a galleon rather than your own ship. Lavishly furnished and decorated, it's nice to have a bit more space to yourself. Crow's Nest Your yacht's mast is equipped with a lookout platform that provides a great vantage point to survey your surroundings. It also attracts the crow population of the Docklands who seem grateful for a place to perch on the water. Keen not to peck at the hand that feeds them, quite a few have decided to leave you alone. Choose two more types of crow to ignore. Narrow boat. Though usually associated with canals rather than open water, the narrow boat doesn't seem at all out of place in the Docklands. Its slightly old fashioned wooden construction and homely shabbiness serve to make it seem rather welcoming. Powered by an old oil burning engine, the craft chugs along at a snail's pace and even though it's a little on the noisy side, manages to attract relatively few of the Docklands hazards. Lit by oil lamps below decks, the narrowboat includes a functional if basic kitchen complete with an oil-fired AGA as well as a bedroom, spare room and living room. Storage space is plentiful but the dimensions of the vessel make everything a little, well, narrow. Despite this, narrowboats are generally well decorated and exude a feeling of welcome and safety. Seafarer Take two water hazards and four land hazards. Take four water features and two land features. Perks. Infinite oil. Though fuel isn't too hard to come by in the Docklands, it's not something you will ever need to worry about. 
Both your engine and AGA have an unlimited supply of oil, allowing you to cook, warm, and chug to your heart's content, whilst blissfully ignoring the fuel gauge. Living Figurehead Your boat supports a lovingly carved animal figurehead, or ornament, that's animated by some kind of magic. Though it's generally asleep, it's happy to wake up at any time for some conversation, and gives great advice and guidance. It knows the Docklands well, and can usually put you on the right track for whatever errand you're on. Redecoration Your boat is capable of magically altering its entire interior at your command. Peeling wallpaper and rusty cookware can be immediately replaced by fresh paint and a remodeled kitchen. This magic also extends to a mild tidying effect, which tries to set things in order around the place when you're not looking. It won't do the dishes, though. Houseboat Larger and yet more ramshackle than a narrowboat, the houseboat looks like it would be more at home floating beside a tropical resort or sunny beach. Nevertheless, its shabby chic interior doesn't look half bad in the flickering light of its many candle bras. It even has a small jetty up back for you to sit on and trail your toes in the water. With a melody of comfortable upcycled furniture and a kitchen with a sizable charcoal grill, the whole place exudes a decidedly laid-back atmosphere. This is very much in keeping with the movement of the vessel itself, which seems content to just go with the flow. You can navigate it within the dock via the use of an onboard pole, much like a gondola, but in the deeper open water, it will simply drift as it pleases. Its movements always seem to take you where you want to go, in a rather roundabout fashion, and will take you back to the shallows whenever you wish to return. Amphibian. Take free water hazards and free land hazards. Take free water features and free land features. Perks. Back Garden. At the rear of your home is a spacious platform, complete with planters, a lawn, and even a tree or two. It's the perfect place to tend a garden, with plants growing amazingly well considering the lack of sunlight. You could cultivate most anything you want back here. Wonder Hammocks. A trunk inside the houseboat opens to reveal several dozen hammocks that can be strung up to accommodate extra guests. Sleeping in one guarantees a restful night and does wonders to help you recover from any mild to moderate illness, hangover, or similar malady. Impossipole. Your ponting pole is capable of making it to the bottom, regardless of the depth of the water you are navigating. Even when well out to sea, it takes nothing more than a smooth push or two to send your houseboat along your desired path. It's not the fastest way to travel, but it grants you a lot more control and you can punt for hours without feeling the touch of fatigue. Lifeboat Station Situated a little apart from the main centre of the Docklands, the lifeboat station cuts a lonely figure. Supported by stilts, the majority of the structure comprises a hangar that houses a powerful motorised lifeboat launched via the protruding slipway. Mounted behind the vessel is a motorised crank that it is used to winch it back in, though attaching it is a fiddly process. The craft itself is fast, Powerful and fairly large, though it's not built for habitation, and therefore has nothing aboard that would resemble living quarters. While it's the fastest vessel on the water, it also has the most fuel-intensive and noisy engine. This tends to draw more attention from waterborne hazards, though it's much quieter if you travel at lower speeds. The lifeboat station also boasts a small attached cottage, which makes a homely, if rustic, dwelling. It has all the rooms you'd expect in a family home, including a master bedroom plus a couple of spares. Living room with open fireplace, plus a kitchen with a wood stove that also fires the central heating. Amphibian. Take free water hazards and free land hazards. Take free water features and free land features. Perks. Auto crank. The process of attaching your vessel to the mechanical retrieval crank is rather hard work. Fortunately now, the mechanism had developed a mind of its own, and simply approaching the ramp will cause it to automatically attach, reorientate your craft, and return you to the launch bay. Searchlights. Your lifeboat is equipped with powerful spotlights that illuminate the dark waters of the Docklands impressively well. Any hazards they shine upon shrink away from the intense beams. Though running them for too long will cause them to overheat and short out, they're a great form of defense. Terrace block. Your lifeboat station is not completely isolated, but is rather part of a series of cottages. While she can't stay in order for them yourself, they provide accommodation for others and mean you'll probably have at least one more neighbour to meet. You gain plus one resident. Boathouse. 
a dusty, old, largely wooden building of an antiquated design and character. Veiled in grime, it looks like it hasn't been used for a long while and doesn't appear to have ever been intended for habitation. Part of the building resembles a clubhouse, with a single large room and some furniture scattered round, as well as an adjoining office and water closet. Behind the bar area is a spacious, if basic kitchen, with electric ovens and boiler. The rest of the structure extends over the water and houses an enclosed mooring area with a mid-sized rowing skiff tied up. While as dusty as its home, the skiff is in pretty good condition and glides smoothly over the water without too much effort at the oars. In fact, rowing comes easily to you the moment you take hold of them. While the interior is lacking, the boathouse has lots of square feet and is overall the largest of the available accommodations, but you'll need to do a fair bit of home improvement to get it up to standard. Landlubber. Take four water hazards and two land hazards. Take two water features and four land features. Pugs. Sailing Club. Rather than just a single rowboat, the boathouse contains a variety of small vessels, including an inflatable motorboat, one-man sailing skiff, canoe, kayak, and even a pedalo. You will now have your own choice of ships to embark on, each with its own strengths and weaknesses for you to get to grips with. Renovation. Your home is in a bit of a tumble-down state and could do with a touch of DIY. If that's not your thing, then no fear. Simply leave the necessary materials, timber, cement, bricks, nails, etc. inside when you head out on the water, and when you return, you'll find your home has done some work all by itself. You might have to put up with it being a bit of a building site for a while, but it'll look real nice when it's done. Number 9. Your time is up. If for any reason you find yourself in trouble whilst out on the water, you'll hear a loud announcement from a megaphone atop the boathouse calling you home. This will temporarily repel any hazards you face and put you on a beeline back to the boathouse. Waterside Apartment A compact studio flat situated right on the harbour with a small jetty attached to the backyard. Whilst a little on the cosy side, it supports a double bedroom, spare room and an open plan kitchen slash living slash dining area that are all quite comfortable. Lit by electric lights and heated by electric heaters, your meter says that your flat is powered by a rooftop lunar array and battery hub. You may have to go easy on power use during the new moon or risk running dry. Located close to the centre of the Docklands is only a short walk to the high street. The water is equally accessible via a small motorboat moored at your personal jetty. Whilst quite fast is not exactly spacious and could probably seek no more than four comfortably, with no below decks or even a bunk in the wheelhouse to stay the night in. Still, it's fine for day exertions and travels at quite a clip, even if the engine makes a bit of a racket. Landlubber. Take four water hazards and two land hazards. Take two water features and four land features. Perks. Streetwise. The streets themselves seem to have taken a shine to you, and now twist and contort themselves in such a way as to help you out when they can. You'll round a corner only to find yourself unexpectedly at your destination. Spot a side alley shortcut exactly where you need it for similar such phenomena. Pigeon Spikes Your apartment is fitted with rows of sharp spikes to discourage the perching of birds. All species of crow are put off by these protrusions and give your home a wide berth as a result. They can still pose problems, as you venture further away. Cabin Cruiser. Your motorboat has been upgraded to a slightly larger model. Below decks, you'll now find a small bathroom and a single cabin with enough room for one bunk. It's pretty cramped as accommodations go, but now at least, you have a vessel that you can comfortably spend the night on. Right, now you've got you located. I'll bet I'll explain a little more about this place. At least, the little I do know about it. Like I said, it looks a little nasty, and it is. But if you stay on your toes, you manage to get by without too much trouble. You'll need a way to bring home some money if you're going to stay. There's all manner of trades for a person to ply in the Docklands. I'll give you a little something to get a leg up on one of them. Item. Choose one. Merchant's Abacus. A simple wooden device to help perform calculations. Only it gives you an improved aptitude for figures, as well as an uncanny knack for spotting a good trade. A merchant can make a reasonable living buying and selling goods from the myriad ships that call it the Docklands, especially if they make the right connections. Fisherman's Nets A few bundled up nets with floats and weights attached. They are of excellent quality, rarely get tangled, and are very straightforward to repair. 
They never seem to bring in a huge catch, but there always seems to be something in them after you pull them aboard. They work better on more mobile vessels. Steve Dawes Hook A boat hook that makes handling heavy loads just that little bit easier. It's very good at snagging distant objects and hauling in whatever needs hauling. Loading and unloading ships may not be the most glamorous career, but the work keeps you fit, pays reasonably, and is pretty much always available. Scavenger's Rods A set of dowsing rods for those who want to try their hand at beachcombing, salvaging, or other fortune-finding professions. They take skill and time to use properly, but with practice, you'll be amazed at what they lead you to. Shipwright's Plane A tool for shaving planks that glide smoothly over even the roughest wood. Having it in your possession gives you a real knack for woodworking, particularly shipbuilding and repair. A shipwright's trade can be a little sporadic, but in the Docklands, it surely can't be that long before someone needs work on a ship. Barkeep's Cloth A bar towel with a brewery's branding atop it. The rouseabout nods approvingly at the sight of it. Having it on you makes you a born publican, with everything from lifting kegs to mixing cocktails seemingly second nature. The barkeep trade picks up around festivals, then drops off. You may come to enjoy the mix of lulls and exiting busy times. Helmsman's Compass A navigation aid that no seaman should be without. Using the compass helps magically guide you when on an errand for another, such as a charter voyage or delivery. When sailing for yourself, it's just an ordinary compass. Taking passengers and trips or ferrying cargo suits those who long to feel the wind in their hair. Entrepreneur's Deed a couple of deeds to a few vacant areas of the Docklands, not particularly valuable on their own. They suit an ambitious individual looking to start their own business. Just holding them causes your mind to buzz with a few compelling ideas. Entrepreneurship suits those looking to forge their own path in life. Clerk's Inkwell A quill pen and a pot of ink, suitable for those going into the clerical profession. The Raspar says that if you stick at it, you could one day work your way up to Harbour Master. He says it's a tough job, but you get to meet some interesting people. The inkwell makes filling in the voluminous paperwork a little swifter and more tolerable. Okay, that should stop you from starving to death at least. Still, there are other things to worry about here. Lots of other things. Depending on whether you're more of a land or a seafarer, you'll encounter a different mix of challenges. Sure, they're dangerous, but you'll learn to live with them. Jewel hazards can be taken as land or water hazards. Sea Mist Rolling in from the water and thick enough to reduce visibility to metres, sea mist causes serious problems, whether you're aboard ship or on land. Mercifully slow moving, you may be able to make it home or back to port before you are engulfed, if you act quickly. Unpleasant Climate The weather always seems to be against you in this place. Whilst it doesn't rain or get cold any more often than normal for the region, it always happens at the worst time for you, and in the way which is highly inconvenient. Build your fires high, and never leave the house without dressing for the worst. Salt Corrosion The sea spray is murder to anything metallic, and attacks your possessions with a zeal that seems almost vindictive. You'll be replacing spare parts and scrubbing rust much more often than your fellow residents. Keep an eye on your gear in case you suffer from a serious failure at a key moment. Blackbeak Gulls Filling the air with their choking cries, these visiting scavengers descend in swarms on the Docklands, blanketing all below with their droppings and attempting to steal anything edible. Small groups appear periodically to worry vessels, and they have been known to steal small valuables if they're left unattended. Storms From time to time, the Docklands are struck with major storms. High winds tear through the streets, whilst massive waves beat across the sea walls of the harbour. You'll need to have your vessel moored inside their protection or be far out of port to weather the tempest in safety. Battening down the hatches would be advisable. Lone Times During the lulls between major events at the Docklands, there sometimes come strange periods where everyone seems to vanish. For days at an end, the Docklands become a ghost town with not a soul in residence, save you. The people always return eventually, with seemingly no knowledge of their absence. Water Hazards Blackwater Floating atop the waves beyond the mouth of the harbour are small pools of the treacle-like black water. If a craft comes into contact, the substance will begin to creep along the hull, slowing the vessel, and if left unchecked, dragging it beneath the waves. Keep a sharp eye out 
and be ready for a swift retreat if you encounter it. Angry Waves White horses foam atop the swell as waves bear down on ships beyond the safety of the harbour. Whilst rarely tall or powerful enough to swamp a vessel, they can sometimes possess a malignant quality that makes navigation difficult. It's almost as if they're trying to drive you away from your intended destination. Mysterious Bells Peeling out from what seems like just beyond your field of vision, the hauntingly musical tones of bells can periodically be heard on the water. Whilst following them never gets anyone anywhere but lost, their sound has a siren-like quality that takes more than a small effort of will to resist, as if you have been offered a great temptation. Riptides Beneath the surface of the water there flow powerful, invisible currents that can easily drag vessels a long way of course. These riptides give no signs on the surface and change location from time to time, making them hard to map. Keep a close eye on what landmarks you can, or you may end up taking a most unwelcome detour. Moonfish Swimming invitingly just below the surface of the water, these silvery creatures appear as if composed of living moonlight. Attempting catch for any fisherman, if you do harm one, you will invoke the wrath of the others. These fish will begin to gather around you, bearing their tiny fangs and looking for a chance to strike. You have been warned. Shallow Sleepers Out in the deeper waters beyond the harbour, quiet travellers sometimes hear, or feel, deep bass notes emanating from beneath the waves. Produced by dormant aquatic giants, the consensus in their case is that it is best to let sleeping dogs lie. Move quietly when in deep water, lest you rouse something not easily appeased. Land Hazards Non-Euclidean the geometry of the Docklands doesn't appear to be abiding by Newtonian physics. The streets wind and twist in a decidedly ominous fashion that confounds, frustrates, and sometimes endangers. It's much harder to get from A to B with this going on, and you often find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Psychic Landscape The Docklands has tuned into your mental state and subtly warps itself to reflect it. If you are anxious, it becomes more intimidating with lengthening shadows and eyes peering from windows. If you feel overwhelmed, it becomes more oppressive with surrounding buildings closing in on you. A disciplined mind could fight against it, but remember that it isn't just all in your head. Can't shake the feeling. You'd hope that over time you'd become more accustomed to the landscape of the Docklands, but no matter how long you stay here, it still makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. No matter how much you grow to understand it, you will always feel at least a little uneasy here. Alley Thugs Some of the strange spectral residents of the town have it out for you, and are certainly not the kinds of people you'd want to run into in a dark alley. If they catch you alone on the remotest streets, you can expect a mugging, and possibly a beating, if you're unlucky. Be careful where you walk. Owen Decline The industrial wasteland that stretches on endlessly outside the Docklands is now trying to creep inwards. The further you travel from the centre, the more ravaged your surroundings become. Broken glass litter streets lined with rusting fences. Accidents are much more likely and everywhere is a little more hostile to your presence. Spiteful Shrubbery Whenever you pass a floral resident of the Docklands, you get the feeling that it has it in for you. Trees lean menacingly towards you, their branches snagging at your clothing or brushing against you in a disconcerting manner. They can't seem to do anything that a normal tree couldn't, but their machinations can cause a surprising amount of problems. There's one other danger here in the Docklands that you need to be concerned with. I'm sure you've noticed them already. You get used to them, and like I said, if you keep on your toes you should be okay. Even so. The Rasspout holds out his hand, and the crow flutters down and perches on his wrist, a strange amulet held in his beak. I have an uh, associate who's kindly given me a few of these hair charms. It can protect you from one type of crow that lives in this place. I'll tell you about the different sorts. Choose wisely. Crows. Choose one type to be protected from. Carrion crows. Mid-sized birds of average intelligence. Carrion crows prefer to scavenge, but are eternal opportunists. They seem to have a sixth sense of weakness, and will likely descend on you when you are at your most vulnerable. Usually found in ones or twos, they occasionally form small groups. 
Luckily, they are easy to distract with bait, as no carrying crow can resist an easy meal. It's fair them to show up when not wanted. Hooded crows. Hooded crows are the most social of their family, and often work together when foraging or scavenging for food. They're also tolerant of harsh weather, and are less likely to be grounded by wind or rain. Though their propensity for teamwork can cause problems, they are slow flyers, and their white bodies make them the easiest of their family to spot. If you see one, be ready for others. Ravens. Larger and more intelligent than most of their cousins, ravens will spend hours watching you as you go about your routine, searching for any vulnerabilities to exploit. They have the strength and guts to pose a threat, though thankfully they are far less numerous than the other members of their family, and usually live either alone or in pairs. Keep your wits about you if you see one. Rooks A crow and a crow's a rook. Like the old adage suggests, rooks are almost never seen alone, and they're capable of fierce attacks with their mid-sized bodies and wicked beaks. Territorial birds by nature, rooks tend to cluster around their rookeries and seldom venture too far from them though they make new ones each year. Learn where they are, and avoid them, if you can. Jackdaws By far the most numerous members of their families, jackdaws blanket the gnarled trees of the Docklands and fill the air with their short, sharp calls. Whilst you are likely to encounter fewer than a dozen at a time, they are too cowardly to make a move, unless their numbers are much higher. Listen for the sounds of their calls, and if you see them massing, then make a quick exit. Corvids. So rare that their presence has largely passed into legend, these giant creatures are rumoured to still pass over the Docklands once in a blue moon. Truly mighty entities, they're said to possess great magical power and diabolical intelligence. If you ever see their shadow passing you, you'd be wise to flee. A few insist that one could commune with such a creature, or perhaps, if one chose one's words carefully, even make a deal. There are a few points of interest around the Docklands that are worth a glance at least. I'll tell you about the ones I know. Again, what you find would depend a bit on whether you're a landlubber or seafarer. Land Features Midnight Store Located around the corner from your home, or mooring point, is the Midnight Store. Always open, it supports a good selection of the kind of products you'd expect from a convenience store at reasonable prices. The owner, Mr. Patel, isn't particularly chatty, and of course doesn't speak your language, but he always gives service with a smile. Twisting Tower At the waterfront there stands an odd-looking tower stretching up into the dark skies above. The tallest structure in the Docklands by a significant margin, exploring it will take some time and dedication. Its purpose isn't immediately clear, but you have a feeling it has something to do with the communication barrier that permeates the Docklands. Old Garage At the outskirts of the Docklands is a highway leading into the endless industrial wastelands. Beside it is a garage housing the only non-maritime vehicle here, a nondescript sedan. If you can get it running, you'll have a shot at leaving the Docklands via land, though what you'll find beyond on that night shrouded road is uncertain. The Pier Stretching out into the murky waters and lit by flickering electric lights, the pier contains myriad amusements for those willing to part with their coin. From trashy fairground games to slot machines, the pier caters to those looking for a little base entertainment. You might even be lucky enough to win a few prizes. Chip Shop Manned by grubby staff with greasy aprons, you have no difficulty placing an order here in spite of the language barrier, since there's only one thing on the menu. Fish and chips. Damn good fish and chips at that! Whilst not the healthiest food, it's cheap, quick, and gets the job done with a minimum of fuss. The Britannia Inn This ancient pub is located right at the heart of the Docklands and is regarded as a fine watering hole by its residents. Sometimes lively, sometimes quiet. It's a place that's usually open, selling drinks at a little more than fair price. When inside and intoxicated, patrons somehow find it easy to connect and communicate than they otherwise would. Water Features Phantom Lighthouse. From time to time, a distant beam of light can be seen sweeping over the dark ocean beyond the harbour. The disembodied source of this light is known as the Phantom Lighthouse. Coming and going seemingly at random, it provides welcome illumination to those abroad and unknown contents to 
to as any curious investigator. Oil Rig Farther out than any other feature, the lonely oil rig is always visible by his winking red lights and the sporadic brilliance of his natural gas flare. Completely unmanned, it provides an opportunity for explorers to delve within and examine its winding and twisting innards. Dangers and rewards are to be found within. Tidal Caves Skirting the coastline outside the Docklands will reveal a series of inlets into the caves. Covered at high tide, they are explorable when it drops with some emptying completely and others remaining half submerged. Rooms abound with treasures that lie within, though you must watch the rising of the water lest you become trapped. Shallow Reef Some distance out from the Docklands, a patch of ocean is lit with an eerily beautiful phosphorescence. Close to the surface, a shallow reef is flourishing with strange glowing corals and fish visible beneath the surface. You'll need to dive into the cold, dark water to explore this natural wonder properly. Ship aground. Marking the presence of a potential dangerous sea bar, the Queen Anne is an old paddle steamer run aground long, long ago. Split down the centre of her hull, she is accessible to those seeking to examine her interior, though explorers should be aware of the tide and seek sound mooring for their craft if they do so. Rocky Island. Alive with animal life, this low-lying rocky outcrop is tall enough to be fairly visible and yet still low enough to be comfortably reachable by the myriad seals and otters that call it home. These animals, along with the seabirds that live there, are only docile and welcoming to visitors so long as they don't disturb them or outstay their welcome. Well, that's about it for the geography. Of course, there's plenty of people who live here too. I'm something of a sporadic visitor myself, but these folks have been around for a little while and most of them plan on staying, at least for the immediate future. I know I said it could be tough to make yourself understood around here, but I suggest trying to get to know a few of them. It's always good to have friends. Residence. Choose free. Paul, the Hitchhiker. The archetypical drifter, Paul Crowker, is a well-travelled man and the Docklands is merely his most recent stop-off. He is very happy to be here despite his more foreboding qualities. Apparently, compared to where he came from, it really doesn't seem so bad. Paul's a really easy-going guy and really has been around. Though he doesn't speak multiple languages, he has a real knack for communication and seems by various means to be able to make himself understood at a basic level with most everyone. His wanderlust is always on display and he yearns to move on from the Docklands, struggling to linger long in any one place or with any one person. Asta, the Daydreamer Asta suffers from a patchy memory. She has trouble recalling much of her life and struggles to form new memories. This absent-mindedness has garnered her reputation as a bit of a space case, but she doesn't take it personally. Travelling through life with a detached air, nothing in the Docklands seems to bother her that much, and she takes life as it comes. Trying to befriend Asta is a trying experience, though she is generally friendly and chatty by the standards of a Docklands resident. You'll find yourself going over the same ground rather often. She is largely a landlubber, living in a houseboat that never leaves its moorings. Kenneth, the caretaker. Upcountry Ken is getting on in years, but is still amiable enough. He cooks up a mean fish supper, enjoys a good glass of brandy, and has an appreciation for classical music. Working as a caretaker in the harbour, he has a good understanding of the basics of navigation and resides on his very own houseboat. Though he's happy to enjoy a little camaraderie here and there, Ken is very much a loner and prefers his own company most of the time. Expect him to politely excuse himself for your presence early and often. If he does invite you to join him for a fish supper and a glass of brandy, you will know he really does want you around. Kea, the foreigner. Kea Windreshki hails from a country you've never heard of and definitely can't pronounce. Making a living doing odd jobs around the Docklands, she is a huge fan of the many events that take place throughout the year, always attending and getting enthusiastically involved. Kea can be a little tricky to get along with. Despite a language barrier, you notice enough words in common here and there to achieve something approximating a conversation. The real issue comes with the completely different set of customs and social norms she has. Expect the unexpected, and to accidentally offend her more than once. Dwight, the fisherman. Dwight's a man who barely says a word. The rouse spell suggests he might be the superstitious type, 
thinking it's bad luck to talk in a boat, and Dwight is almost never out of one. Married to his work, he's a seafarer through and through, venturing out daily in his fishing trawler. Dwight's a stoic sort, and usually works alone, though he usually brings back catches that you'd expect from a fully crewed vessel. He does seem keen to take on apprentices from time to time, though they'd have to be okay with long hours of silence. Despite his muteness, aboard ship there's a kind of unspoken communication between him and his charges. Marcel, the Mime You have no idea whether or not Marcel is her real name, since she never speaks, but that is what everyone calls her, and she does respond to it. As her attire and makeup suggests, she is a mime, and spends most of her time as a street performer, though she never seems to make much money. A purist of her art form, she takes herself rather seriously. Marcel's mime ability is seen capable of warping reality, with the object she conjures truly manifesting, if invisibly. These amazing powers make her a potential valuable ally, though she's not easy to get on with. After all, everybody fucking hates mimes. Miller, the Navi. Miller works in the harbour loading and unloading the steady stream of vessels that come and go in the Docklands. One of the more long-term residents of this place, he's accumulated a wealth of knowledge that he'd love to share with his fellow residents. He just can't seem to get the words out. Miller's not easy to understand, speaking in some obscure dialect that no one can wrap their heads around. Despite his friendly overtures, you'll need some extra help if you want to exchange info. Miller does love to laugh and joke, and his expressive face and good temper allow you to enjoy an evening of merriment in spite of the communications barrier. Yuna, the World Walker Yuna is the only other resident that shares the roustabout's immunity to the communications barrier. She claims to have made her way through wild frontiers, cloud-draped forests, and underground catacombs to come here. Eager for yet more new experiences, she wishes to explore the Docklands, then move on. Yuna is strong, both in ability and personality. She's accumulated a number of extraordinary gifts on her journey, and manifests a number of supernatural abilities. She is also increasingly a magnet for trouble, with the Doctor's hazards drawn to her with incredible intensity. She can handle herself. Be careful not to get caught in the crossfire. Leroy, the busker. Usually found strumming his banjo somewhere along the Doctor's main street, the sound of Leroy's music is a welcome serving of comfort in the gloomy atmosphere of the Docklands. Though he mostly plays country, he is happy to do requests if you drop a coin in his hat. Leroy is hard to hold a conversation with. His speech is rambling and nonsensical, with frequent changes of topic, sometimes mid-sentence. He communicates better with his music, which often seems to capture the mood of the town and brings people a little closer together. He loves a good jam session too. Viviana the artist. Viviana loves to paint the vistas of the Docklands. From stormy oceans to the cherry oscuro illumination of the night market, she is most often seen capturing one scene or another on canvas. Usually too caught up in her work to notice those around her, if pressed she will politely ask that you wait until she has finished, until speaking to her. Viviana prefers to express herself with a brush, and if you do manage to converse with her, it will have to be at least somewhat related to painting. In spite of her one-track mind, Viviana's hobby has given her a good knowledge of the workings of the Docklands. Cedric Stiles, the Teddy Boy Cedric Stiles fancies himself as something of a local tough guy and attempts to run something akin to a protection racket. Demanding money from residents in order to protect them from some of the Docklands hazards, he's not very rudite and prefers to talk with his fists, with which he communicates well. Cedric's a lad that enjoys a beer and a cigarette and can be good fun at parties. Few of the Doctor's hazards can be punched away, but Cedric is true to his word in facing up to them. If you stand shoulder to shoulder with him, you'll find you develop a camaraderie faster than talking could ever achieve. Trix, the Lady in Red Trix is a career bartender, and appears to work in every single watering hole in the Docklands. Always clad in her hallmark red blouse, she delivers service with a smile, and is always happy to lend a sympathetic ear to a customer, provided she's not too busy. Trix never reciprocates in conversation beyond what is necessary, and politely declines to answer any questions about herself or her life. Getting past her wall of polite professionalism could be tough, especially since with the hours she works, it's hard to run into her when not on the clock. Tim, the Cabin Boy Little Tim is only a part-time resident of the Docklands, regularly embarking aboard various vessels only to return later for another layover. In his mid-teens, 
Tim shows a high degree of motivation and a fascination with all things nautical. Happy with his footloose lifestyle, Tim appreciates the offer of a place to crash when he returns from a voyage. Speaking with a mixture of bizarre and unfamiliar slang, understanding specifics in a conversation with Tim is a challenge, though you can usually get the gist of what he is trying to say. He is a helpful guy to have around and is happiest lending a hand with one project or another. Admiral Troy, the Submariner Residing in a high-tech submarine, Admiral Troy has a very formal manner and a speech is laced with military-sounding code words that you don't understand, seemingly quite intentionally. Haughty and superior, she treats everyone as if they were under her command. Her role at the Docklands is unclear, but she's among the best equipped of his residents. Reading between the lines of her behaviour, you suspect that Admiral Troy secretly longs for companionship and merely struggles with dropping her guard. Getting to know her won't be easy, but the loyalty she displays to her small crew suggests that it may be most rewarding. This place has its share of interesting happenings as well. It seems like it's never too long before some kind of event takes place. You can choose whether or not you want to participate when they do come along. Each one has its own upsides and downsides, so which you get involved in is up to you. Events. Choose as many as you like. Macar Puppet Show. From time to time, a small booth appears by the water, though its owner is never seen apart from their wrists. Every few hours they perform a show with some impressively detailed puppets. The subject matter is rather morbid, with murder, adultery and other gruesome happenings frequently depicted. Still, it's entertaining enough if that's what you're into. Skylight Festival. Constructed from wire and paper, with a small flame to boil them into the air, these lanterns are launched in their hundreds by residents of the Docklands in the Skylight Festival. The tradition involves attaching a valuable object to the lantern as an offering before launching it into the heavens. Supposedly a quality offering brings good luck, though if you're thoughtless or miserly, you'll likely receive the reverse. Funeral Barge In one of the Docklands' more solemn festivals, from time to time as many residents line the shores to observe the slow transit of a burning barge out to sea. Whether this is an actual funeral ceremony or something more symbolic is unclear, but during the ceremony and for days after, strict yet unspoken customs are to be observed. It might be wise to learn them. Battleship Brawl Announced by the roar of engines and the crash of cannon fire, the Battleship Brawl is a conflict that has taken place in the seas outside the Docklands since time memorial. The two vessels are evenly matched and the result each time is ultimately a stalemate, but there is always a nominal winner. There is much betting on the event, which is always spectacular though needless to say for your own health, you should try not to intervene. Crow Hunt In order to keep the population of crows around the Docklands under control, Residents embark on semi-regular crow hunts. Travelling in groups with antique guns, the day is spent blasting as many black-feathered creatures as possible, whilst bagging a few for the pots here and there for good measure. Crow meat is surprisingly tasty, and the reduced population makes the dockings a little safer, but crows have long memories, and will bear a grudge against participants. Sea Shanties Though no one is quite sure what triggers the phenomenon, some evenings the whole of the Docklands come together for a night of drink and song. The sound of sea shanties fill the air with hundreds of voices joining in song. On these magical nights, for once, everyone seems to be able to understand each other, the words coming naturally to all whether they know the song or not. A great way to make friends. Expect a rough morning the day after, and a sleepless night if you try to stay home. Fish Festival Held at regular intervals, the fish festivals of the Docklands are a community celebration of all things seafood. With almost all residents participating, most homes become another venue to try a new delicacy. All food is offered for free, but if you wish to partake, you'll be expected to provide a dish of your own to share with all of the other revelers. Chuanchanit This spectacular and risky festival involves rolling or carrying a series of flaming tar barrels through the streets of the Docklands, with more than a few burns usually being sustained en route. Requiring some strength, courage and perhaps a little foolhardiness, the ritual is believed to ward off evil spirits. If you participate, you can expect a small lessening of the hazards of the Docklands for a little while, though all you're really doing is trading one risk for another. Ferryman's Transit One occasional visitor to the Docklands is shrouded in silence and sublimity. Conducting his trade without a word, the ferryman accepts payments only in golden jabloons, which are not easy to come by. If you can meet his price, 
he will give you safe passage out into the black expanse of the open water. Rumours say the journey leads to a strange place where the seas flow up into the sky and into another water-covered world beyond. The roustabout comes to a halt, leaning over the railings at the edge of the harbour. That concludes the tour, pal. Now you have to decide whether you want to make your home here. Like I said, I can take you home if you'd rather. Time doesn't stand still here or anything. It takes along just like at home. Still, if you do stay and choose to go home later, people have a way of confabulating a reason for your absence. Everyone will just think you went on a really long holiday or something. He pauses. I've laid it all out here, pal. I suppose whether or not you want to stay is entirely down to whether or not you think the Docklands is somewhere you'd like to live. So, is it? Is it?